We've spent some time on signals, how to represent data as, as communication signals. We've just spent some time on transmission media, some examples of wired media, and some of the concepts when we use wireless media, like antennas, path loss. There are a few slides in the, in the previous lecture on transmission media towards the end that we skipped over about examples of satellite and other wireless systems. So they are just examples which I think we've mentioned, and you probably know many examples of wireless systems already. So uh, that's why we skipped over them quite quickly. The main thing from the previous topic, from yesterday and the week before, was about antenna, antenna gain, uh, path loss, and those relationships uh, that allow us to determine distance, receive power, and so on. Today, we'll introduce signal encoding techniques. How do we, some different ways in which we take our data that we want to communicate and encode it as a signal. Up until now, we've used simple examples like if my data is a sequence of zeros and ones, then one scheme what we've said is if we have a bit, what, a, a bit one, send a high signal. A bit zero, send a low signal. That's a signal encoding scheme. It's a way to generate a signal based upon the data we want to communicate. But there are others, so we'll go through some others today. Because of limited time, I'll just introduce a selection of schemes today, and we'll not finish all, hopefully the first two set, and some of the things we may skip over and return to after the midterm if we need to explain any further. But we'll just introduce some of the schemes. And we split it into four groups because we distinguish between the analog and digital data. Digital data, anything made up of zeros and ones. So text files, images encoded uh, in binary, that's our digital data. Analog data is like audio, video, analog video, uh, other measurements, measured data that is a continuously varying data over time. Remember the difference between analog and digital? Digital is discrete values, analog continuously varying. So depending upon the data we want to communicate, we use different schemes. And the signals that we transmit this data with will all also distinguish between analog and digital. Digital signals will be discrete pulses of some power level. Typically some discrete voltage pulse. So we send uh, some voltage, say plus 5 volts, for some period of time. That's a high level. And then for another period of time we send, say, minus 5 volts. And we'll use this as a digital signal. An analog signal is one which will continuously vary over time. And how do we change the shape of an analog signal? What are the three main things that will change the shape of an analog signal? The three basics of a sine wave. Amplitude. Think of our signals we've looked at. We can change the shape by modifying the amplitude, the height, the frequency, and the phase of the signal. And we'll see those come into play when we look at sending data using analog signals. When we have digital signals, think we just have a pulse, one level or another level. With analog signals, we've got, think of your sine wave. So let's go, today hopefully we'll do the first two, maybe we'll jump to the last one if we have time. This is general about signal encoding techniques. Uh, we'll mention this as we go, after we go through a few examples. This will, some of the terms we'll introduce as we go through examples will be described on this slide. Uh, before we go to the specific ones, generally these pictures show the different approaches depending on whether we're using digital or analog signals. So the top picture is a, using a digital signal. So the middle component is what's sent across the, the communication system. So we start with some data, analog or digital data, and then we encode that data into a digital signal. 
which is a sequence of pulses. We send that digital signal across our communication system. The receiver has a decoder that takes those received pulses, the different levels, and converts it back to analog or digital data. That's when we're using a digital signal to communicate our data. Irrespective of the type of data, we encode it into a signal and decode it at the receiver. And the, the plot here is an example of a digital signal. X of t is the middle part here. The other approach is when we use an analog signal. This is a plot in the frequency domain, but we can uh, also have plots in the time domain. Here we take our data, digital or analog, and modify some continuously varying signal to transmit that between transmitter and receiver. And the way we modify it is what we call modulation. We take a we take a analog signal and we modify either the frequency, amplitude or phase of that analog signal according to what the data is. And that process we'll call modulation. So at the transmitter we take our data and we use a modulator. We send an analog signal and at the receiver we take the input analog signal and convert it back to the data. And that process is called demodulation. A device that does both of these, modulates and demodulates, is called what? A device that... The short name for a device that does both of them is a modem. A modulator and a demodulator. That's what a modem does. Like your... Um, maybe your ADSL modem, your cable modem, or your old dial-up internet access modem, it took data as input and generated an analog signal as output sent across the telephone line. And the receiving modem has a demodulator in it and receives an analog signal and converts that back to data. So the general uh, device that does both of them is a modem. And what's the name of the device that does the transmission and reception of a digital signal? Anyone? You've heard of it, maybe, but maybe not in what you expect. Here we combine mo modulator and demodulator to get a modem. Encoder and decoder, well encoder, another word, is just coding. So, called a codec. Some C -O -D -E -C. A device that can encode and decode is called a codec. And if you deal with audio and video and converting between different formats, sometimes you'll come across this word of a codec. Your mobile phone, when you talk, you create an analog, your voice is analog data. Your voice is continuously varying data. Your mobile phone has an encoder that takes that input audio and converts it into digital and sends a digital signal to the mobile phone tower. So your mobile phone has an encoder and a decoder or a codec to do that. We'll see some other examples of them as we go through, and even in the next lecture. Different reasons for different, using different techniques, but let's go straight to some of the techniques. We want to send digital data, zeros and ones, as digital signals. So the digital signal, some sequence of discrete voltage pulses, say plus 5 volts, minus 5 volts, or plus positive and negative some voltage. Any questions before we continue? Okay, ready for your exam? There are always questions about these signaling schemes in the exam. Not too hard though. We send a discrete voltage pulse. Any other questions? Otherwise, let's keep the noise down for this last lecture. Any questions before we move on?
okay? We send discrete voltage pulses. We call each pulse a signal element. You may have seen this term up, come up before when we talk about signaling. And our data, our zeros and ones, are encoded into signal elements. And the example we've seen is we've used, for example, well, we've used the opposite of this. Binary 1, data bit 1, we encode as, say, a low level, a low voltage, say, negative 1 volts. And binary 0 as a high level, say, plus 1 volts. Or it could be the opposite. But we map our digital data to one of the levels of the, the digital signal. And that signal is, re is transmitted for a period of time, and that represents a, s a single signal element. The rate at which we can send bits is called the data rate, bits per second. But we'll also talk about the signaling rate, which is the rate at which we send signal elements. Sometimes it's the same as the data rate, sometimes it's not. It's sometimes called bored the signal elements per second. So we'll see some examples of that. There are different schemes for encoding bits to digital signals. This is an example of one scheme, almost the, the obvious one, or maybe the opposite of the obvious one. Here are some examples of others, and we're going to go through all but the last two. This describes the schemes, and we'll use some examples to, to illustrate them. It says, what is the mapping for our bit, 0 or 1, to the particular level of our digital signal? And the top one, non-return to 0 level, says when we have a bit 0, we transmit a signal for some duration at a high level and a bit 1 at a low level. That's it. That's one of the signal encoding schemes. And then we'll see some of the others and, and, and compare them. Let's draw some. We have a sequence of bits, 8 bits I want to send. So that's my digital data. To send it, I need to send a digital signal. So I encode it. And let's use the, the first scheme, which is called non-return to zero level. Non-return to zero in that our signal will be either positive or negative. It will not be zero volts. We will not return to zero volts. We will see the level uh, when we come to the next one. There's an alternative of this one, invert. And it's quite simple. We, if we go back to our description, want to transmit a bit zero, send a signal at the high level. Bit one, low level. So the signal becomes bit zero high for some duration. And we'll talk about the duration in a moment. Then we have a bit one to send, so we change the level to low. Then we have a bit zero to send. So we go up to high, transmit the signal for that duration. Then another bit zero, so it's high again. Bit one, second bit one, zero. There's our digital signal which represents our digital data using non-return to zero level. NRZ level. What voltage do we use? It doesn't matter. It's just that, that one's negative and one's positive. What is the duration that we hold at a particular level? Well, that is based upon the signaling rate. This is a signal element, 
and the duration of each signal element is the same. Okay, each signal element has the same duration. If the signal element was one millisecond, what's our signaling rate? Signal element duration is one millisecond. What's our signaling rate? Anyone? If the duration in this example is one millisecond, then we can say the signaling rate we have 1,000 signal elements per second. And, all right, signal elements, SE, just to be clear, so we don't confuse with bits. In this case, there are 1,000 signal elements per second if each signal element has a duration of one millisecond. This is just an example. The signal element duration may be a different value. What's our data rate in this case? How many bits per second? One thousand bits per second. In this scheme, each each signal element represents a single bit. So 1,000 signal <coughs> elements per second is the same as sending 1,000 bits per second. In most of the examples we'll see that's the case, but in some it's not always the case. The signaling rate and the data rate don't have to be the same. We could have a single signal element representing more than one bit. So if the signal element represented two bits, it would be 2,000 bits per second. Or we could have a signal element that represents half, half a bit. That is two signal elements per bit. So it's, no long, it's not necessarily one to one in this case. Any questions on non-return to zero level? The one I just drew is on, in your handouts. So it's in the, the next slide on the handouts, except it's not all bits. So I've got eight bits here. This example in the handouts is the same first eight bits, but there are a few more bits. So you don't have to draw it again. It's, it's the top one. Another scheme, non-return to zero inverted. or inverted on ones. When we have a bit zero, there's no transition. That is, we don't change the level. When we have a bit one, we change the level. From positive to negative, or from negative to positive, depending upon the previous level. Same sequence of bits, let's try it with Remember the sequence of bits, zero, one, zero, zero. Maybe I'll write them again just so I can move. Let's assume we start at the low level. We'll come back to that in a moment. When we have a bit one, so we just transmit the bit zero. When we have a bit one to send, we invert, which make a transition. When we have a bit zero to send, we don't invert. 
we keep the same level. So I have a zero descend, so keep the same level. Another zero descend, same level. Now I have a bit one descend, let's invert. The next bit is a bit one, so we invert. And then two zeros. So this is NRZ inverted. Two different schemes. transmitting the same sequence of bits using a different digital signal. We will not compare them yet. We'll just go through how they work and then later we'll talk about some of... Why would we have different ones? Why don't we just use the first one? Well, there are some differences. Signaling rate and the data rate are the same in this case. Bipolar AMI. Now we have to send bit zero, we have zero volts, no line signal, so send at zero volts. Bit one will alternate between positive and negative level for each subsequent bit one. In the previous example, I assumed that we start at the low level, the first bit at the low level. If we started at the high level here, you would have seen the inverse. It would be upside down because it depends upon the previous bit. When we have a bit one, we change based upon what the level was before. So we need to start at some level. Let's do bipolar AMI. Bit zero. Bit zero as zero volts, yes? Yeah. Uh, so, all right, in the non return to zero inverted, we need to assume that the previous bit was some level. Okay, so let's say we start, assume we start at the negative level, that means the next one will change to positive. But if I assume the opposite, I assume we started at the positive level, the zero would be positive and then the one would go down to negative. So it depends on where you start. So you need to make some assumption about where you start. So the same if you start with a bit one. Let's assume we start with a negative level and the first bit is a bit one that will change us immediately up to the positive level. Okay, So make some assumption as to where you start. For a real system it will be described which level to start at okay, when you start the sequence. In an exam or a quiz, unless I say otherwise, you can assume either. If you did it the other way you'd have the inverted signal. Same with bi bipolar AMI. Let's assume the previous, the previous bit one was negative. There is no previous bit one here, but let's assume it was negative. When we have a bit zero, we send it zero volts. Bit one, a bit one, we go to positive. Bit zero, back to zero. Second bit zero at zero. The next bit one goes down to negative. 
the next bit 1 up to positive. And then 0, 0. We alternate when we have bit 1s. Positive, negative, positive, negative, and just keep doing that as we have bit 1s. The, the level is sometimes referred to as a mark, so, or, or bit 1 as a mark, so alternate mark inversion. We invert for, for alternating uh, ones. This assumed that the previous bit was a negative. If you made the assumption, the opposite one, that the previous bit one was positive, then you'd invert this whole picture. That is, if it was a one here, then the first one would be negative because it's relative to what happened before. So this one does return to zero, and that has some consequence later when we look at some of the characteristics of these schemes. Let's do another one. Actually, we'll not draw it. Pseudo ternary. Bipolar was with a bit zero sent at zero volts. With a bit one, alternate between positive and negative. Pseudo ternary is really the opposite. With a bit one, send zero volts. With a bit zero, alternate between positive and negative. Okay. I will not draw that. But you see with pseudo ternary, bit one, we have negative. Uh, sorry, bit one, we have a zero. Bit one, sorry. Bit zero, we alternate between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. It's like the opposite of the bipolar AMI. Let's try Manchester encoding. Manchester encoding. When we have a bit zero to send, in the middle of our interval, each signal element goes for a particular duration. In the middle of that duration, we'll make a transition from high to low. And when we have a bit one, in the middle of that duration, we'll make a transition from low to high. So Manchester encoding. Let's see if we can draw that one. Let's repeat our bits so I can remember. Same sequence of bits. Let's try Manchester. We're going to make a transition from high to low. Let's go back to our description. From high to low when we have a bit zero, and from low to high when we have a bit one. I need to get this one right. Bit zero. So now our Think of this as the same duration as before, but in the middle, we make a transition. So bit zero, we go from high to low. Bit one, we'll go from low to high. We're already, the, the bit one starts at this point. We're already at the low level, so we maintain that, and then in the middle, we go up to high. That's the bit one. Bit zero will go from high to low. We're already at high. Next bit is a zero. We need to go from high to low. So at the start of the transit, at the start of the bit interval, we need to go up. So here we go to high, and now the bit zero, high to low in the middle. <coughs> 
So every bit zero must start at high and go down to low. So in this case, since we were at low beforehand, we make a transition at the start of the interval first. Bit one, we're at low, we go up to high in the middle. Next bit one, we'll need to go down at the start and then in the middle go up again. Here we're there. So we have Manchester encoding. Every, every signal element has a transition in the middle. This is used in, in LANs. So when you're sending data between uh, computers using the LAN cable, you've got digital data, zeros and ones from your computer, and it sends digital signals using Manchester encoding. So it's very common. Questions on Manchester, how it works? You'll be happy to know in, in an exam, I will not ask you to remember all of these in exam, at least remember the first two, NRZ level, NRZ inverted. The others I would describe. If I say, here's a sequence of bits, create the digital signal if you use differential Manchester, then in the exam I would describe this, or similar. Okay, so you need to be able to interpret what this means and then draw the signal. Differential Manchester. Similar, but here there's always a transi transition in the middle. When we have a bit zero, there's a transition at the start as well. With a bit one, there's no transition at the start. So that, let's try that one as our last scheme to draw. If we have a bit zero, we'll have a transition at the start of the interval. Let's assume we start high. We have a bit zero to send, so we must make a transition. And every bit has a transition in the middle. So that's the first bit zero. Assuming we started at high, bit zero, change at the start, then in the middle, change again and that leaves us at high. Now we have a bit one, and the rule there is don't change at the start, just change in the middle. So we maintain the level for half of the interval, and then make a change. Bit zero, change at the start, end in the middle. change at the start as well as in the middle, another bit zero, change at the start as well as the middle, a bit one, don't change at the start, so keep it the same but in the middle change, a bit one, don't change at the start, keep it the same in the middle change, zero we change and another zero. slightly different from our previous Manchester. We're changing in the middle for every bit and also at the start for bit one, a uh, bit zero. Differential Manchester. 
There are some other schemes. We'll give some examples of where they're used. Maybe we can now. We'll come back to this. Just some examples. Where, where? Here. Non-return to zero is used. So they're used in different technologies. So USB, RS-232 serial cables use non-return to zero or non-return to zero invert on ones. Manchester encoding is used in LANs. So Ethernet wired LANs. Uh, some of the ones that we haven't covered, but are listed on that, the previous slide of uh, I think B8ZS, based on bipolar AMI, are used in some wide area network technologies. Here's a signal. What's the data that you received if you use non-return to zero level? You receive this signal. If you're using NRZ level, the basic one, the first one, what data did you receive? Zero zero one zero zero one one zero. Okay, easy. Non return to zero invert on ones. What's the first bit? So the other non return to zero invert on ones. Non return non return to zero i means when you have a bit one, the signal inverts. It changes the level. So note at the start there's an inversion. So the first bit must be a bit one. So the first bit one, zero, one, it inverts, again it inverts, one, it stays the same, zero, one, easy. Non-return to zero level. What's the sequence of bits you receive? How many bits did I receive? Non-return to zero level, well, let's see. Uh, at the start, it looks easy. This would be zero. How many zeros? Some say three, some say four. Yeah, you need to look closely. And this is an important point. The receiver receives the signal. So it's important for the receiver to know the exact duration of each signal element. If there's a grid, you can work it out. But if it's four in this case, but the receiver, if it knows the duration, the receiver must know exactly where the next signal element starts. Because if you don't know where the next signal element starts, then you don't know if you've changed from the old zero to the new zero. You wouldn't know how many zeros were here. Well, they know the duration, but the problem in practice is sometimes the clocks of the receivers are not synchronized. My transmitter is sending a signal where each signal element lasts for one millisecond, but the clock of the receiver is such that it thinks it's one millisecond, but it's actually, say, 1.5 milliseconds. Clocks of devices at very high 
uh, are not, may not be so accurate at very small time frames. So the receiver may have a problem if it cannot synchronize its clock in this case. It may think this is actually three zeros or four zeros or five zeros. The clocks must be synchronized very well to do that. So that's actually a problem in this scheme. Is it three, four, or five zeros? Well, we can check, and I can. Uh, the way I created it, it was four zeros. But from a receiver's perspective, it may not know that exact timing, and therefore it could think this was three zeros and then a one, and that would result in a bit error. So. One of the differences between the different encoding schemes is that some have problems if there's a long sequence of bits of the same, the same bit, in this case a long sequence of zeros, we get the signal at the same level, it's just constant. And it's hard for the receiver to know where does the next bit change. So it's hard to synchronize and that may result in errors. If you use say, Manchester encoding. If there's a long sequence of zeros with Manchester encoding, thousand zeros in a row, there will always be a change for every bit because with Manchester encoding, we change, we change in the middle all the time. So even if there's a long sequence of zeros with Manchester encoding, it's easy for the receiver to know when the bit net bit next bit starts because it sees a change. Ah, oh, must be a new bit. So synchronization is not such a problem with Manchester and differential Manchester encoding. That's a good thing about them. But with some of the others, if we have a long sequence of bits, they become hard for the receiver to, to work out what bits are being received. We're not going to go too much detail into the trade-offs. We'll just mention them. Uh, just to say the fact that some are better than others in different manners. One of them is synchronization. The better they can synchronize, the less chance of errors. Let's draw a bipolar AMI signal that you receive. You work out the data. Uh, bipolar AMI. Try and work out the data received. Anyone? What, what's the first bit received? So far. You're the receiver. You receive the blue signal. You need to work, as it arrives, work out the bits received. Before you work it out, any questions? Ask me and then we can answer to everyone. Later? Why not now? We've got time to answer questions. Okay, so if there's no questions, what's the first bit? Zero. Zero. Second bit? One. Okay, so work out as you receive the signal, what are the bits? We'll keep going. Again, from the start. What happened here? Error. Here, this scheme, because we expect alternating positive and negative, it has inbuilt error detection. This is the signal received. But we know that the transmitter would never send this signal because the transmitter follows the rules that we either send zero volts for a bit zero 
or alternate between positive and negative for bit ones. So we have a positive, a negative. The next one we expect should be a positive because the transmitter would transmit a positive. But if we receive zero, something's gone wrong between the receiver and the transmitter. So in this case, we say it's got error detection. At this point, some error has been detected. What was the error? Well, it depends upon the system. Maybe there was some error in the, in the transmission system and the levels were not quite right. But this is an advantage of some schemes that are designed such that the receiver can automatically detect errors. It may not be able to fix those errors, but at least detect them. Do we have more? Uh, I think that's all for those examples. Bipolar AMI has some inbuilt error detection. Non return to zero does not. Okay. Even if it's at the wrong level, we don't know that at the receiver. Let's compare just quickly some of the, the differences between them. And just very quickly on this. So which encoding scheme is best? Well, it depends. There are different factors. When we transmit these signals, they occupy some bandwidth in our transmission system. And some occupy more than others. The more bandwidth you occupy, the worse. We want to use a small bandwidth to send the same amount of data. A picture that tries to capture that is that this is the frequency plot or the, the frequency plot of the different encoding schemes all compared to each other. The wider the plot, the worse it is because it uses more bandwidth. So non-return to zero, a bandwidth, if you look at the width here, about one. Manchester, in differential Manchester, is slightly wider bandwidth. These others, bipolar, AMI, pseudo ternary, and some modifications of them, B8ZS, HDB3, have the best in terms of bandwidth. They're the narrowest uh, concentration of the frequencies. So there's difference in terms of the bandwidth occupied. There's difference in terms of synchronization. Some, the receiver can synchronize based upon the signal received. Others, they cannot. And if you cannot synchronize, you may get bit errors when you have a, a continuous sequence of one level. Some have inbuilt error detection. Some don't. Some work better in the presence of interference. Okay, so we'll not discuss why, uh, but when a designer chooses a scheme, they need to consider all of these factors. Some are more complex. For example, the Manchester encoding and differential Manchester, there's always a change in the signal level, which means our transmitter must change the level quite often compared to the others. You see, look at the number of changes for 8 or whatever, 12 bits compared to the others. It means our device must, must be more complex to be able to change the levels much faster. So these are more complex and maybe more costly to implement. Any questions about digital data using digital signals? That's about all we want to say. You'll see in past exams, here's, here's a signal, tell me the data. Or, here's the data, draw the signal for any of these schemes. Again, I will, not, I will not describe the first two to you, but any of the others I would describe in the exam. I would say this is the definition of how it works. Not so hard.
There are some ex extensions of bipolar AMI, these two, B8ZS, HDB3. They're slight extensions that with bipolar AMI, when you have a long sequence of zeros, again, we have the constant zero volt signal. That's bad because of synchronization and bad because of sending at zero volts is, is not good for the receiver. It's, uh, so these schemes, when we have a, a sequence of zeros of a particular length, they change it with some special sequence to avoid this long sequence of zeros. That's all. You don't need to understand how they change, but they're just modifications of bipolar AMI to overcome this problem of having a long sequence of zeros causing us the same signal. There are different modifications there. They're called multi-level binary schemes. We actually had three levels, positive, zero, and negative. This one's even easier. We have bits to send, but now we have a continuously varying analog signal to transmit. There are three basic techniques, and this captures them and explains them quite well. We have a sequence of bits. Ignore the digital signal. Just look at the sequence of bits. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, so on. That's the digital data we want to send, but we need to send an analog signal. Well, we know how can we change the shape of an analog signal, vary the amplitude, the frequency, or the phase. So the first approach, it's called amplitude shift keying, is to say when we have a bit 0, send at one amplitude. In this case, in this example, the amplitude is zero. And when we have a bit one, transmit an analog signal, in this case a sine wave, at a different amplitude. So plus one, for example. So I think this flat line is a sine wave with zero amplitude, which is just a zero signal, no line signal. So change the amplitude depending upon the bit. So when you receive this signal, again, we have a signal element duration. If the signal is zero volts for this duration, then that means the amplitude is zero. That means the bit received was zero. If the signal amplitude is non-zero in this case, a plus one, then it corresponds to bit one being received. So shift the amplitude of the analog signal based upon the bit that we want to send. The amplitude doesn't have to be zero. In this example, it's zero and a non-zero value. It could be plus one and plus two, okay, two, two non-zero values. The next one, instead of changing the amplitude, change the frequency. Frequency shift keying. The B means binary, which just is, there's two different levels of frequency. Binary for two. It's the same here. There are two levels of amplitude. It's just commonly called BFSK. When we have a bit zero, send a signal at one frequency. Here we see the frequency, there's one repetition in our time interval. When we have a bit one, change the frequency. In this example, it's a higher frequency. There are two repetitions in the bit interval. This is, again, just an example. The concept is change the frequency depending upon the bit to be transmitted. This Low frequency for bit zero, high frequency for bit one. And of course, we have phase shift keying. Bit zero, in this case, we send a phase of pi. You see, we start going down, then up in our sine wave. When we have a bit one, we send at the normal phase, a phase of zero. So we get the normal go up first and then down. Frequency is the same for each signal element. The amplitude is the same, but the phase differs depending upon bit zero or bit one. Amplitude shift keying, phase shift keying, amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, phase shift keying. B means binary, just meaning two levels. Any questions about sending digital data using analog signals? I told you this was easy.
Again, given a signal, you should be able to answer what was the data received. We're not limited to these three. We can combine them in different ways. So the hint here, binary frequency shift keying means there are two frequencies. We can have more than two frequencies. I tried to draw it before. What's the data received? And Which first? Okay, first. Is it ASK, FSK, or PSK? Listen to my question. Is it ASK? FSK or PSK? So the amplitude is the same, so it's not ASK. The phase is the same. It's frequency shift keying. And you should see maybe that some components have different frequencies. What's the data received? Do you receive this signal? It's not BFSK in this case. Okay, BFSK means binary frequency shift keying, meaning two different frequencies. This ha is, has four different frequencies. Only three are shown in this case. Okay, so this is a trick. That is, it doesn't have to be two different frequencies. And more importantly, you must know the mapping of the frequency to the bits. It's not always low frequency bit zero, high frequency bit one. It could be the opposite. <laughs> so you need to know the mapping, the scheme. In this case, I chose this scheme. If I want to transmit bits zero, zero, two bits, I send a signal for a particular duration of some frequency f. If I want to send the bits 0, 1, I send it double the frequency, 2f. So, higher frequency. Bits 1, 0, 3f, 1, 1, 4f. That was the scheme that the transmitter uses. And the receiver uses that to decode what's received. And the hint in the picture is that these, this grid or these uh, vertical lines show the, the duration of each signal element. So, here is the reception of the signal and you may be able to guess but if you look at the frequency this is two repetitions in one signal duration this is four this is one and this is two there's no example of uh, three repetitions so this is the lowest frequency Zero, 0 is received at this point. <coughs> this is 2 times the frequency, so zero, 01 is received. In this duration, it's 4 times the lowest one, so 1, 1 received. Let's write that down. So just be aware that we don't, we're not limited to just two frequencies and that you need to know the encoding scheme to know the exact mapping from the, the signal elements, the analog signal, to the bits, the digital data. In this case, the way I created it was this was double the original frequency, 2F, so this would be 0, 1 for the, this duration. And then we measure the signal for the same duration here. The receiver measures it and they see it's four times the original frequency. Whatever the frequency was, whether it was one hertz, one megahertz or whatever. So that would be one one being received. Here it's one times the original frequency, so zero zero and two times 
0, 1. So here, think of this as one signal element. We transmit an analog signal for the fixed duration at a particular frequency, but it represents two bits in this case. If we had eight different frequencies, we'd have three bits per signal element. Remember, because we need to be able to represent any sequence of bits, we need to be a, a power of two, the number of different levels. We can do the same with phase shift keying. Instead of two phases, we can have four phases, 16 phases, 256 phases. And it's common for both frequency shift keying and phase shift keying to have multiple levels, more than two. Not so common with amplitude shift keying. Any questions on what I'll call this is FSK with four levels, or four FSK, sometimes it's written out. Instead of binary FSK, it's four levels, or even QFSK. Another common scheme. Think about what the signal will be in this case. If we have a sequence of bits to send. Here, we combine amplitude shift keying with phase shift keying. And the name for that is called QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. You don't need to remember that, but we'll see it come up in many examples in real systems. But it uses both. And the scheme I've defined in this example is that if we want to send bits 0, 0, I will set the amplitude to be 1 and the phase P to 0. For bits 0, 1, keep the amplitude at 1 and change the phase to pi. So in our sine wave, a phase of 0, we go up and then first. In a phase of pi, we go down first. So upside down sine wave. For bits 1, 0, we have an amplitude of 2 and a phase of 0 and amplitude of 2 and phase of pi for bits 1, 1. So again, we have four combinations. So they don't have to be combinations of the same uh, shifting. The previous one was four combinations of frequency. This is four combinations combining two different amplitudes and two different phases. Can I draw it? Maybe. What's the first one look like? Well, bit 1, 0 is what we want to transmit. So we transmit with an amplitude of 2, and I may need a grid, and a phase of 0. So uh, So this is an amplitude of plus 2 here, and a phase of 0 means it's the normal shape sine wave. 1, 1, amplitude of 2, phase of pi, so it will go down first. Zero, zero, amplitude of 1, phase of 0, so the normal shape sine wave, but half the amplitude. One one is amplitude of two phase of pi. So we just have enough combinations to represent any sequence of two bits. The receiver, they measure the signal. They will determine the phase, the amplitude, and determine the bits received. This combination of amplitude shift keying and phase shift keying is very common in real communication systems called QAM. And they're not limited to just four levels. There's 
16 QAM, 256 QAM, and even higher. The more levels, the more bits we can send per signal element. Here we have two bits per signal element. The faster we can send bits. But we've said it before, the more levels, the more chance of errors. Because there's a smaller difference between levels. So the receiver must be able to distinguish between what level is received in the presence of noise. Any question on the combination of ASK and PSK? Yep. In this case, it's just an example I chose of how to combine. That is, this scheme was designed by me. Okay? I chose to map 0, 0 to amplitude 1, phase of 0. But someone else may design it and say, amplitude 2, phase of pi equals 0, 0. It doesn't have to be this combination. Okay, so that scheme is part of the designer's choice. When you buy a product that uses this, it will be part of the standard that says every device must follow a particular scheme. So you must know that to be able to map the bits to the signal. The values of the amplitude and the phase are not so important in this case. They just need to be different. Now, in practice, how much they're different by the, may impact on performance, especially phase. A phase of 0 and a phase of 1 is very similar. Therefore, you try and set the phase to be completely different. Where are they used? So just go back. What do we skip? This is what modems do. A modem sends an analog signal carrying your computer digital data. So shift keying, it's called shift keying, the SK is called shift keying, is what a modem does. We can only send analog signals, but we want to send digital data, so we use shift keying to convert that digital data to an analog signal. We saw the three basic techniques, ASK, PSK, and FSK, but you can combine them as well in more complex ways. Now, I think that's about all we want to say about those, apart from give some examples of where they're used. Amplitude shift keying, so they have different characteristics. Amplitude shift keying tends to be quite inefficient in terms of occupying the bandwidth. Therefore, it's only used when you have very low data rates or you have a very large bandwidth, like optical fiber. Frequency shift keying is used in telephone systems. Coaxial cable, so receiving cable TV and some radio systems. You can have more than two frequencies. So M goes from two to four, as we saw, and can go up. Higher data rate, but higher chance of errors as the number of levels go up. Phase shift keying commonly used in wireless systems and combined with amplitude shift keying, it's called quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM, especially used in ADSL and some wireless systems. So your ADSL modem, it takes your computer digital data and sends an analog signal and how does it map the bits to the analog signal using a combination of amplitude and phase shift keying? And I think that's all we want to say. Some, some other examples of where they're used. Mobile phones, Wi-Fi, cable modems, DSL, satellite broadcasts use PSK and PSK with ASK. Any questions on digital data with analog signals? One more, 10 minutes to go. We'll skip to the last one. It's easy. At least introduce it. <laughs> 
Here we have analog data like someone speaking, some voice, some audio, or some music. And we want to send it as analog signals. And we'll just very quickly introduce the concepts. We can do it quickly because you know them already. Amplitude modulation, AM, AM radio. What we do, we have the middle, the middle plot here, I think, is the data. That's the analog data we want to send. So it represents someone's voice as they're speaking. The top plot is what's called a carrier frequency. We want to send the analog data, but at a different frequency than a, what the analog data is based upon. So voice, voice when you speak ranges from about three, 300 hertz up to about 3 kilohertz. So the frequency of human voice is less than about 3 or 4 kilohertz. But we want to transmit it, say, wirelessly from a radio station to your car, AM radio. And to transmit the signal a long distance, we don't transmit it at around 4 kilohertz. We transmit AM radio about 1 megahertz. So it's effectively shifting the frequency of the analog data to a much higher frequency so that the signal can travel a long distance and so that we can have small antennas. So the carrier frequency is the one that we want to send our signal at. So for example, for AM radio, this may be, I don't know, AM radio channel may be seven, 950 kilohertz. That's called the f carrier frequency. This represents the, the analog voice or music. And amplitude modulation, we modify the carrier based upon the input data. And we can see the resulting signal that we transmit. We see the amplitude of our carrier changes according to the input data. This is the basics of amplitude modulation. This is what's transmitted. The frequency is around the same frequency as the carrier, but the amplitude goes up and down. As the receiver receives this signal, it measures the amplitude and maps that back to the received data, the voice or, or music. Frequency modulation, FM radio. Same concept. FM radio, what's the channel? FM radio channel? 107 point something. 107.5 mega, megahertz. So the carrier frequency is 107.5 megahertz. But the, the data is the music and the people speaking. That's the middle plot here which is around uh, several kilohertz. So with frequency modulation, we change the carrier frequency slightly. So it's not exactly 107.5 megahertz. It varies over time. As the input data, in this example, as it's high here, we get a, a slightly higher, a slightly lower frequency. It's not as changing as much. And as we get to the negative input data, we get a very or much higher frequency compared to the carrier frequency. So this is the, the signal that's transmitted if we use FM. The receiver receives this. It, over time, it records the signal. It measures the frequency of that signal. If the frequency is lower, slightly lower than the carrier, then it means the, the amplitude is positive here. If the frequency is slightly higher than the carrier, then it means the amplitude is negative. So they get this frequency modulated signal to determine the received analog data. And there's phase modulation, but it looks very similar to frequency modulation. Okay, that we change the phase as we have a change in the input data. Where are they used? Well, AM, FM radio. Yeah, the best examples, but used in other uh, communication systems as well. And that's all we'll say about those ones. Just be aware that AM, FM, and, and PM, in terms of phase modulation, are about how to change what's called some carrier frequency based upon the input analog data and generate an output analog signal. So 
AM, FM, PM are about analog data sending as analog signals. And we have some carrier frequency which is changed depending upon whether using amplitude, frequency or phase modulation. You will not need to interpret or extract data from plots. That's too hard for us. Okay? Not like digital data. The third one we'll cover after the midterm. Okay. So just to summarize, in preparation for the exam for this topic, know what is AM, PM and FM with respect to analog data and analog signals. ASK, FSK, PSK with respect to digital data and analog signals. And at least remember NRZ level, NRZ invert with respect to digital data and digital signals and be able to uh, use the descriptions of the other schemes where necessary. You don't need to remember them. We will stop there. <laughs>